Joe Biden is inaugurated as Captain Unity with a mission to unite America. The EU and Australia open new fronts in the war against the tech giants. And the UK ponders a vaccine-led future of long-term closed borders. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show. So we saw Joe Biden's inauguration this week and it was fine. But to listen to some of the mainstream media, this wasn't just the inauguration of a president. This was the emergence of a new superhero, Captain Unity. Now, don't get me wrong. It would be a fabulous achievement. And he made a pretty decent speech laying out his determination to get the job done. But it's not as though we've not heard this before. George W. Bush billed himself as a uniter, not a divider. Barack Obama, in his first term, called on people to move beyond the differences of red and blue America. And, well, I don't recall any of those terms being specifically famous for their unity, because they weren't, of course. The trouble with calls for unity is that they're easy to make. But what are we supposed to be unifying around? If unity means we won, so shut up and go away. Obviously not unity. Mary Trump, for instance, said this. To be clear, unity is impossible if traitors like McCarthy, Hawley, Cruz et al. aren't held accountable with the severity their crimes against our country demand. Ah yes, the unity of the French Revolution always ends well. On the other hand, what unity can't mean is that the governing party is supposed not to behave true to their political agenda. It's not democracy and it's not realistic. So what does it mean to unify? Surely it's about treating each other as, in this case, fellow Americans. So you discuss and argue within the framework of mutual respect, understanding that reasonable people can disagree profoundly on matters of policy without bad faith or evil intent. And it's about respecting the rules of the institutions of democracy, including, of course, the protection of free speech, the right to be heard. If Joe Biden's going to achieve that sort of unity, it's his own side that is going to be as much or possibly even more trouble than the other. Right now, you have people calling for anyone and everyone who ever supported Trump in any way whatsoever to be made to pay. And you have people saying that Trump being thrown off all social media should be just the start. That is not, I say it again, the backdrop for oodles of unity. On the plus side, I think it's true to say that although Biden will follow a centre progressive line, he won't indulge his radicals with measures like ending the filibuster, adding new states and packing the Supreme Court. But of course, what he does do won't be to the taste of a GOP. Even though Biden won't be kicking the hornet's nest every single day, like his predecessor liked to do, it is nevertheless built into the business model of the political parties and the partisan media to play up the outrage on a daily business. It's how they get their clicks. So it's not going to feel like unity, regardless. In the meantime, Joe Biden did what his predecessor also did, making a big show of passing a bunch of executive orders in his very first few hours to communicate what a can-do, get-the-job-done kind of a guy he is. Amongst those were things that had been long promised, which included signing back up to the Paris Climate Agreement, which, of course, as I've said numerous times here, is the easy and frankly purely symbolic bit International agreements don't solve problems, action solves problems. And meeting the promises of taking the US to match Europe and the UK in targeting net zero by 2050, that is the real challenge. By the way, Ted Cruz provoked a degree of derision when he tweeted this about the Paris action. By rejoining the Paris Climate Agreement, President Biden indicates he's more interested in the views of the citizens of Paris than in the jobs of the citizens of Pittsburgh. Ah, those pesky Parisians imposing their opinions on the rest of the world. Assuming the Democrat radicals don't succeed in bringing Ted Cruz down, you can assume he will continue over the coming months to position himself as a potential successor in the spirit of Trump. The question is whether that's going to be a viable play or not. According to the Wall Street Journal, Trump has discussed with associates the idea of forming a new political party, the Patriot Party. If he'd wanted to find the one single thing that would most motivate Senate Republicans to convict him in the impeachment, that would surely be it. 
since that would be the way to ensure that Trump is disallowed from standing for president again. And you can sort of see that scenario shaping up. Mitch McConnell said to the Senate, the mob was fed lies. They were provoked by the president and other powerful people. And they tried to use fear and violence to stop a specific proceeding of the first branch of the federal government, which they did not like. But we pressed on. It could be, but it works the other way round, that Trump has no intention of really standing again, but he's using the idea of a threat of a Patriot Party with a Trump-approved candidate as a threat over Republicans to ensure that they don't impeach him. What's becoming clear is that Trump has well and truly burned his Republican bridges. He will not be the GOP candidate in 2024. For the record, I would say that Trump would be ill-advised to have a go at starting a political party, not a serious one. His general disdain for many of the mechanics of politics means that he would be incapable of building the disciplined machinery that you would need to make that sort of thing work. The best he would get would be a vehicle for a standard third party candidacy, as we've seen in the past. It would have no chance of actual success, only as acting as a spoiler to the Republicans, guaranteeing a firmer grip on power for the Democrats, which you'd assume would not be his objective. In the meantime, Trump gave a farewell speech. It was a better speech than it was given credit for. To be honest, if he'd given speeches like that through his presidency, rather than blasting nonsense out on Twitter every five minutes, there's quite a good chance things would have been very different and he would be leaving behind a stronger legacy, maybe whisper it gently, not even leaving at all. But then that was never going to happen, as Trump himself underlined as he flew out for the final time with the sound of my way playing in the background, a comedy act right to the very last. The other question people have been asking is where does this leave the QAnon conspiracy theorists? They'd said that Biden definitely, definitely, definitely wouldn't be president. Ah, reality. Reality, that thing that happens even when you don't believe in it. According to reports in some forums, people have turned on Trump for letting them down. Yes, the fact that he hadn't emerged miraculously to take back the presidency, but also because he didn't pardon any of the QAnon Proud Boy Trump warriors who had seen themselves as fighting his fight. But of course, others did what cult members have historically done when the aliens were scheduled to land and they didn't turn up, or when Jesus was going to sail across the rainbow with his AK-47 to sort out the unbelievers. They shrug and they explain it away and they become even more committed to the cause. According to Politico, one forum poster said this, Let this be a wake-up call for QAnon followers and normies. No one is coming to save you. No one man can defeat this evil Marxist machine. OK, but if you were wrong about that whole thing of Trump being the cigar-chomping hero of the hour, you might be wrong about the evil Marxist machine bit as well. I mean, the Democrats have their radicals. And yes, they've even put Bernie Sanders as chair of the Senate Budget Committee doesn't actually constitute an evil Marxist machine in the way that you've been talking about it. Ah, I can imagine the comments section already. Well, in a minute, we'll look at some of the other news for the week. But first, there are some people out there for whom the actions of the last couple of weeks mean that Donald Trump has achieved the status, in one sense at least, of Adolf Hitler which is that he's held to be so self-evidently bad in every single possible way, it is egregious to talk at all about things that he might have done right or lessons that might be learned from him. And all of that. Well, that's just nonsense. It may be that half of America thinks he did nothing right, and maybe a significant portion still thinks he did nothing wrong, but if we step back from the heated rhetoric and look with sober analytical eyes... What's the real final tally for the Trump years? What did he get right that we should hold on to? What did he get wrong that even politicians who style their politics on the spirit of Trumpism in the future should avoid? Since I can't think of a way to annoy more people in a single video, which is this channel's USP, obviously, let's have a go and see if we can make sense of it. We've now entered the period where we're going to be hearing a lot less about Donald Trump on a day-to-day -day basis. Let's reflect on what it all meant before we move into that quieter new world. That video to go live at 7pm UK time, Monday 25th of January. Join me then. 
The removal of Donald Trump from social media platforms seems to have excited the European Union. The EU president, Ursula von der Leyen, hailed President Biden's inauguration, but said that the EU was susceptible to the same forces that had led hundreds of Trump supporters to invading the Capitol building. She said that since the EU might not succeed in convincing conspiracy theorists to give up their beliefs, regulation and censorship of the internet was needed. We want it laid down clearly that internet companies take responsibility for the content they disseminate. She said that it had been right for Twitter to remove Donald Trump's account, but such serious interference with freedom of expression should be based on laws and not on company rules. Now, on one level, I think that's right. Shouldn't be down to Jack Dorsey or Mark Zuckerberg to decide those things. Absolutely. On the other hand, I'm not mad keen on the EU doing it either because laws created by massive unelected bureaucracies about when there can be serious interference with freedom of expression, well, obviously there's no way that could possibly go wrong. Whereas the Trump administration had seen the EU's plans as being hostile to America's interests, the EU's now hoping that Biden will agree to work together on, quote, a digital economy rulebook that is valid worldwide. So there's that to look forward to. One person who disagrees with von der Leyen's support for the Trump Twitter ban is the Russian opposition leader, Alexei Navalny. He said the unacceptable censorship made it easier for the Kremlin to demand that social media companies permanently suspend Russian opposition figures. And as if to illustrate his point, Russia has demanded that TikTok remove a flood of posts supporting Navalny from its platform. This came after Navalny took the bravest single step of the week – Travelling back to Russia, the country where just recently an attempt was made by the Russian state to poison him, that's the sort of courage that sometimes shapes history, often gets people killed, we only get to find out after the event which it was. In this case, it's not looking great. His plane was diverted away from the airport where hundreds of his supporters were waiting to greet him, to the one where Russian police were waiting instead to arrest him. So the wisest course, you might imagine, would be to, you know, keep a low profile. Hope that good behaviour will mean you live to tell the tale. Well, that's not the stuff of legends, obviously. Instead, Navalny's team released a video claiming that Vladimir Putin spent around a billion pounds of illicit money building an extravagant Black Sea palace in the town of Galenzik. Within two days of going live, a video has been viewed by more than 40 million people. The report says the property has a casino, an underground ice hockey complex and a vineyard, of course. Complete with impregnable fences, its own port, its own security, a no-fly zone, even its own border checkpoints. The Kremlin have said what you would expect them to say, but it's all lies. Professor Putin doesn't own palaces. Maybe they're right in this case, but they routinely dismiss all sorts of things for which there is genuinely solid evidence, so I don't imagine we're just going to take their word for it. Fingers crossed this doesn't end up being the last brave thing that Alexei Navalny gets to do. In a variation on the theme of are the tech giants too powerful, this week Google threatened to withdraw its search engine completely from users in Australia. It already provoked a backlash when it was found to be testing out functionality to deny news results to Australian users. But now it's talking about full-on withdrawal. And this comes from the fact that the Australian government is considering legislation to require the tech giant to pay news publishers royalties for their content featuring in search results. The government's arguing that because Google gains customers from people who want to read the news, it should pay newsrooms a fair amount for their journalism. As it is, they're investing in finding and writing about the stories while Google cleans up on the advertising revenue. Australian print media has seen a decline of 75% since 2005, while Google takes more than four-fifths of all money spent on digital advertising. Google Australia Managing Director Mel Silver told the Senate that their proposed laws were unworkable and if brought in, it would give us no real choice but to stop making Google search available in Australia. Well, the government said this was the tech giant bullying Australia and suggesting that it was really about the fear that the country would be setting a precedent for others to follow. In other news... 
Spain is rejecting calls for tough new lockdowns in spite of warnings that its intensive care beds are full and infections have tripled. The coalition government of Pedro Sanchez has refused demands from some of the regions for lockdowns, saying that more rules will inflict too much damage on the economy. In the UK, reports are that the government's beginning to come to the conclusion that a vaccine-dependent recovery is going to mean that borders will have to be closely guarded especially with the fear that new variants will emerge that can get around for protection of the vaccines. According to James Forsyth in The Spectator, the government's looking to the measures that have largely worked in Australia, which is seen as a parallel democracy and a possible model to follow. In Australia, entry is refused, except to residents and those with an exemption, and quarantine has to take place in a state-approved facility. It would be an attempt to protect the domestic economy at the expense of business travel and tourism. Well, I'm not convinced personally. I've said here a number of times that the reason why early action in New Zealand and Australia, why it was able to be effective, was because of their relative geographical isolation. And you can see that reflected in New Zealand Prime Minister Jacinda Ardern's statement this week that the government's goal is now to use regular vaccines to get management of COVID to the point where it will be similar to a seasonal flu. They've presumably realised that COVID isn't leaving the world anytime soon, so they either remain locked up forever or they find a way to open up to the rest of the world again. By the way, I covered in a former video the limitations and problems with the standard PCR test that's currently used for detecting COVID cases. Not that it's of no value, but the way that it's used is prone to generate significant false positives that are particularly important when the number of cases is small, which obviously isn't the case right now. Lo and behold, this week WHO guidance on the PCR test has been updated in line with what I suggested in that video. It notes that the cycle threshold for the test is inversely proportional to the patient's viral load. And it says where test results do not correspond with the clinical presentation, in other words, when somebody doesn't have symptoms, a new specimen should be taken and retested using the same or different NAT technology. Most PCR assays are indicated as an aid for diagnosis. Therefore, healthcare providers must consider any results in combination with timing of sampling, specimen type and a number of other factors that it goes on to list. No, that still doesn't mean that PCR tests are worthless, as some people go around saying. It does give an official acknowledgement to the information I gave in that video, highlighting their limitations. Now, in a minute, we'll reply to a couple of comments, get to the final thought of the week. But first, I will be trying out something of an experiment Wednesday next week, UK time 7pm. I shall be trying my first live stream. Various people have been suggesting I should do one of those. We'll cover the topical issues of the day. I'll take questions from Patreon supporters in advance. There can be questions at the time on, via Super Chat. I've never done a live stream before. Hopefully I won't mess it up too royally. It'll be an interesting experiment one way or the other. So join me there to find out. 7pm UK time on Wednesday. Let's see how it goes. This comment came from the How We Fed the World video. Only problem is that 9 million people die of hunger each year. 850 million suffer from chronic undernourishment and who knows how much death and disease is caused by the harm from poor slash harmful nutrition of industrial food. Malthus and others were right. Millions die and billions harmed. The overabundance of low nutrition food is hugely harmful in rich nations. Now I take the point about low nutrition food, but on the other hand, until the last couple of years, the West and most of the world has seen average life expectancy increasing year on year. And generally speaking, high quality life years added expectancy. So whatever the problems there are with unhealthy types of food, whatever genuine problems nobody could dispute that we face, like the problem with obesity, it's hard to argue that our food and lifestyle have been so bad because if it had been, we would have seen the results in shorter lifespans, not longer ones. Mostly the problems that we have that need attention are down to increasingly sedentary lifestyles, growing levels of sugar consumption, not about the bulk of other foods that are eaten. 
So I think there's some work that could be done there to understand how you would build a better food culture that people would embrace. The traditional approaches of lecturing and nagging and guilt tripping and the like have been shown a deservedly low success rate. The next comment is from the Do Lockdowns Work video. Another question might be, do lockdowns help the NHS to cope with the virus? In which case the answer is almost certainly yes, they have. Yet another question might be, would it have been more economical had this and past governments restructured the NHS and found a method to fund it sufficiently, in which case the answer is not so clear. The first question in the context of a video would be, would the same protection of the NHS ability to cope have been achievable at lower cost by encouraging people to socially distance in a constructive and consistent way rather than by new laws? According to the research paper that I ended that video with, yes it would. Some scientists would disagree with that, so keep an eye on how that research develops, but as I also mentioned, ultimately there are limits to what's politically possible. The UK has had one of the highest death rates in the world on Covid, in spite of the fact that it's done a fair share of locking down. The government would have been unable to resist the pressure to fall in line with the rest of the world. The only thing I think that would have made the difference would have been if Sweden had been the first European country to get the virus after China. What they did then would likely have set the standard for the rest. It was because Italy followed China and they did the whole lockdown thing that other democracies suddenly realised that such a thing was even possible. As for the second part of your comment, to do with the structuring and funding of the NHS, well, I wonder. The thing with any public health service is that whatever you put into it, it's never going to be enough. There are so many very expensive treatments for all sorts of ailments and especially as we luckily, fantastically, have an ageing population, which is a good thing, but with the extra years come extra ailments, you can never have a service that is going to meet all of the needs. However well organised you are, you're going to optimise for dealing the best you can with the standard pattern of ailments that come your way day in, day out. For once in a blue moon pandemic that suddenly demands so much more resource in one place, so much more infrastructure on preventing cross infection and all of it, that's going to be very quickly pushing your system to breaking point. From what I can see, the US system, the UK system, the German system, all very differently structured, but nevertheless had exactly the same pressures once numbers got high enough. I'm sure that we could have been more prepared. I'm not convinced that any changes that we'd have made would have made really that much difference. The three wise monkeys. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. You might think that's timeless wisdom. Places like Twitter and Facebook would be much more attractive places, let's face it, if people could take it to heart. The University of York in the UK has a more surprising take on it. This week it decided that the three wise monkeys instead constituted an oppressive racial stereotype and it pulled an image of them from its website to avoid offence. Upon reflection, we strongly believe that our first poster is not appropriate as its iconology promulgates a long-standing visual legacy of oppression and exploits racist stereotypes. Uh, nope. The Three Wise Monkeys first became popular in Japan in the 17th century. They're associated with the Tendai school of Buddhism, where they're seen as helpers for divine figures, sacred beings in their own right, vehicles for the gods. None of that matters, apparently. A spokesperson for the university said that it had been removed because the image of monkeys has been used in a derogatory way in the past. Not this specific image, not the three wise monkeys, just, you know, some monkey, any monkey. We're now apparently unable to see the image of a monkey in any form without seeing it as having some sort of racist connotation. We don't have an instance of that in front of us, just the belief that somebody might be offended sometime in the future, and that in spite of the lack of intent, that theoretical possible offence in the future is sufficient for the content to be withdrawn. 
it's interesting to reflect upon because we've seen people in the US this week wondering how you could deprogram people who believe in conspiracy theories and do so by removing bad content online. You've had Ursula von der Leyen of the European Union wondering about what legislation could be brought in to police social media to remove fake news to stop people from believing things that aren't true. And then you've got the realisation that along with the genuine made-up nonsense about Trump defending the US against networks of paedophiles, there's a bunch of made-up things that these people and organisations would likely end up defending through censorship. At what point would you get removed from YouTube for pointing out that the free wise monkeys are not a symbol of racism? We know that some people have already been removed from Twitter for saying that a trans woman is not in reality a biological female. People who would extend censorship to look beyond the fact that these are monkeys and whatever they in all their own minds believe comes with that image and reflect instead on the old wise message that they were meant to convey. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil. It's not a call to censorship. You can read it that way if you're so minded but it's a call to self-responsibility. Very important not to get those two mixed up. Hopefully this show will remain the uncensored voice of rationality for some time to come. YouTube hasn't demonetized videos for several weeks now in spite of my expectations a couple of times. If you're on Facebook and you want to support the show, you might want to like the newly set up Facebook page for the show. Be sure to share content on there that you think your friends and contacts might appreciate. YouTube algorithms don't do a great deal to help build this show's audience, although it is happening slowly. So anything you can do to spread the word, to reach people who will value this sort of content, it will all be very helpful. Most important, of course, are the good people who support this show on Patreon. Without their support, it just wouldn't be possible to commit the time to producing three videos per week or indeed to tackle the important topics that YouTube advertisers might be squeamish to be seen alongside. If you would like to join them in supporting the independent, fact-focused and non-ideological content that I aim to produce here, please go to patreon.com forward slash Baker. There have been a number of you that have done that this week and it is always appreciated. Either way, have a great week. My name's Malin Baker. This is The Malin Baker Show.